Welcome to the Story of Money by Abcast, where we explore the past, present, and future of money. I'm Samantha Ab. Subscribe to the Story of Money by Yapcast to learn more about where money is heading. Let's take it back to the 1st of January 1999, the day the euro, a new European currency, was born. The day that the national currencies of 11 countries in Europe became denominations of a single currency. Today, it is the official currency of 20 European countries. The idea and political argument for it is that it would bring an increased integration of European countries, including France, Germany, Spain and Italy, among others, to reduce the risk of war and crisis on the continent. But does it really bind these diverse countries together? Crypto and Web3 technology has introduced another dimension to how coins or tokens have been able to mobilize communities for a shared vision and goal. In this episode, we dive deep into the impact of crypto cultures on the world of money today. From decentralized autonomous organizations known as DAOs to decentralized finance, we examine the ways in which crypto communities are forming and what we can learn from cultures that value community, cooperation, and shared resources. Now let's jump back into my conversation with Dr. Paul Dylan Ennis, a lecturer and assistant professor in management information systems at the University College Dublin in Ireland to get his views on all of this. Some of the large DAOs that have amassed treasuries of hundreds of millions of dollars, even a billion, and people who are governing those DAOs, it's been quite rapid to have people even have a large voting power over a significant amount of money. I mean, usually in the institutional world, you'd have to work your way up to be the CEO or to be a large stakeholder to have influential power over a large chunk of money. But now with DAOs as well, I think there's been a whole group of people that have become, you know, I'm talking about DAOs like ENS or like Gnosis Safe or like Gitcoin where you've got stewards that are overseeing large chunks of money. I definitely see the appeal in that as well, in those people. What do you think about DAOs as well, the ones that have amassed these large treasuries and the community that those DAOs have birthed? Yeah, I think that's like the perfect example of this process where somebody is... So yeah, I I counter this a lot. This is another thing I counter a lot in the classroom where for most people, there is an experience that if you're supposed to get involved with something, then there are like steps that you're supposed to take, uh, you know, over a long period of time, you must climb some kind of ladder, which may include like a social ladder, which is repressed or hidden, which you don't even know about. You have to navigate this as well. You must have lots of experience. Also, just that it's run in a, a much more centralized way, usually. And then if you turn up at a, a decentralized autonomous organization, so I remember when when DAOs were really beginning to revive themselves, because the DAOs are an interesting uh, case historically in that the, the idea was, of course, famously tried out with their DAO uh, and then failed. So, uh, you know, DAOs were supposed to be these autonomous in a technical sense. So everything would be on the blockchain uh, and would execute autonomously. And there would actually be very little human participation. Um, But then that failed in dramatic fashion and then they disappeared. And then there's this Trojan work done by these social DAOs like Meta Cartel and even MakerDAO. And then the idea resurrected. So when it came back, I was a little bit suspicious. You know, I thought this is like maybe an idea that that should have been abandoned and left behind. But then when I turned up, I did immediately notice the... Like I could see people being a little bit hesitant to to get involved because they couldn't really wrap their head around the idea that, you know, here we are in the DAO, we've started DeFi DAO, we've opened the liquidity pool, people have put $50 million in it, and now we don't really know like how to manage it. Like we're, we're, we're setting up these, you could see them doing this, like learning. So we now also accept the idea of, let's say, guilds and work streams. But I can remember when people were actually thinking like, are you supposed to have a guild or a work stream? And they were just like, you know, forming it in real time because they heard that uh, Gitcoin were doing it and Gitcoin's big. So we'll just follow what they're doing. And yeah, so that becomes a major leap for somebody to take to realize that in crypto, there's also a Wizard of Oz situation in the sense that there's, you know, a little bit of a facade. 
And then there's uh, just like a normal person working behind the scene, except instead of it being a normal person behind the scene where it's a big institution, it's a more positive sense of it's just the normal person behind the scene so that you can just write to them and ask them, like, can I join the DAO? Or the application form is a Google uh, kind of like form, which has about five questions. And you just like explain that you want to get involved in the DAO. Before you know it, you're the community manager and you're hosting uh, the Twitter spaces and all this kind of thing. So it happens very, very quickly for people. And I think that's an interesting psychological transition that happens for people where they go from an expectation of much more rigid organizational forms to suddenly discovering uh, that they can get involved. Now, the other side of this, and this is something I really have to stress with students and you see this in job ads so at the beginning of every class I show ads to students for let's say for different DELs and the language that they use so I try to point out like in job ads you know you've all a mention of cypherpunk ideals and decentralization. So make sure you know how to talk about those to know that they're important. Uh, but very, very often you'll see that you're not going to have a boss. We're not going to be babysitting you is another thing. They, like, and they'll use this informal language in the job ads. And that's the biggest thing that people struggle with is, okay, I'm going to go work at the Dell, but I'm not really working for anybody. I'm working for the community. So if you're in Gitcoin and you're involved in the treasury, then really the only time that you're ever justifying yourself is when you do the big budget proposal for the, the snapshot vote, at, say, once a year. Uh, and as long as you're you know, keeping things running, nobody's sort of watching over your shoulder. And I think that's another major thing that people struggle to find, that the self-directedness, the autonomy, uh, because we're not used to it, we've been basically trained for the opposite. What lessons do you think we can learn from cultures that place a high value on community, cooperation and shared resources, like you said, like a DAO that has a treasury, when it comes to shaping a sustainable future or culture of money? And you do mention that you think the world will need all these multiple currencies as well. That it's not just going to be all about one, no maximalism uh, happening. But yeah, what can we learn to drive the culture of these different forms of money now? Now for me. So when I think of this question, I'm really thinking of um, the big problem in Ethereum at the moment. And this is maybe my, my current more research focus, which is the question of DGEN versus Regen. So Ethereum, you know, if we step back from Ethereum and we look at the big picture, you know, you would say something like Ethereum is, of course, that the famous image is a world computer, which comes from Gavin Woods early on. In the white paper, so Vitalik Buterin doesn't tend to use this himself. He tends to favor a decentralized platform, and then in different books, you get other other terminology. But it's actually uh, pretty vague what Ethereum is. If you ask a group uh, to try to explain what Ethereum is, they'll give you big question marks. And the bigger problem is nobody really knows what Ethereum is in the more social or cultural sense. So there's no definition of what Ethereum is for. And that's kind of seen as a virtue, that it's a neutral thing that anybody can use. But then the obvious danger of this is, well, if anybody can use it, anybody can use it. So therefore, you get this degen culture where fly-by-night projects are, you know, targeting retail investors who come in. And, you know, most people's idea of what Ethereum is, is basically, or Web3, uh, actually, let's say more like outside of crypto, and the, everyone who's involved in crypto knows this experience. The first thing they're thinking of are those scams, are those hacks. And so the, the degen kind of issue is a major focus. But then on the other side of it, there's... Uh, this burgeoning community of people who are, you know, call themselves regen that I'm especially interested in. They're also called solar punk sometimes. And for them, it's all about the idea of a building a sustainable, you know, uh, positive Ethereum that maybe even has positive externalities beyond Ethereum long term. So it would actually be a positive influence on the world as a broader uh, sort of picture. And this kind of culture, they're also interested in the idea of building analogs, decentralized analogs to things that already exist. So, you know, you can also look at Ethereum and say they're trying to create a decentralized version of finance. So with DeFi, a decentralized version of organization with DAOs, decentralized version of creativity with NFTs. I often see this as the trifecta. So DAOs, DeFi, NFTs, the three elements of a good society that you could really have would contain finance, organization, and creativity. So they're trying to build this, but they're building this while the chaos is happening right beside them. So if Ethereum is a shared space, like if it was a public park that we all belong to, or the academic literature would say, if we had a shared commons, so we have a shared place that we all 
uh, are in some way responsible for and that we're all actively hanging out in, then the DGENs would be, you know, the, the, the kind of like teenagers that are lighting a fire in the corner and they're like playing loud music or something like this. And they're like robbing people because that, that's the thing that's actually happening, right? They're stealing from people, they're mugging people as they come in and maybe they're even mugging the tourists, right? They're mugging the, the people who are easiest to target because they don't have as much experience. And so in that space, like in the Ethereum space, with all this going on, the usual approach is, well, because it's permissionless, you can't do anything about it. You just have to accept that there's always going to be this financial crime or financial nihilism at the, the heart of everything. So I see this as the paradox of permissionlessness, essentially the problem that permissionlessness is a core philosophical property of Ethereum. It's a good thing that nobody needs to ask for permission, but it's also probably the most, it's probably the greatest danger to Ethereum's long-term sustainability that it's permissionless as well. So there's a double problem going on there. I do try to advocate that we should get some form. We should be beginning to actually state what is Ethereum for. So I would advocate that we should see Ethereum as a commons. So it's somewhere that you know you can't exclude people from, uh, but that if people use it badly, it does diminish the experience for other people. So it is a rival risk, except what's being diminished by the bad behavior is the reputation of Ethereum itself. So the reputation of Ethereum is kind of like the resource that's being exploited by these people. They're kind of like overgrazing the Ethereum comments by abusing, let's say, the goodwill of everybody else. The goodwill being, we believe in permissionlessness, and other people interpret that as like permission to do crime. And if you're in a culture like that, then you can't, because it's also a culture of decentralization, the Ethereum community doesn't want to bring in external parties to, to mediate this problem. It would like to be able to police themselves, like otherwise, what's the point? And that requires that the community begins to define what it considers acceptable behaviors. I would say what you can learn then from similar situations. So outside of Ethereum, when I'm reading about other things, I'm usually reading about uh, commons, so different commons and how they're managed. A commons would just be something that's not run by the government and isn't run by, say, private enterprise. Maybe like some farmland that some farmers have decided, like, we're going to manage this ourselves. There's no need to involve uh, the government. There's no need to involve private enterprise. We'll just manage it ourselves. And I think there's something very similar to uh, what we have here. The lessons that we know from like uh, managing the commons are some hard lessons that Ethereum people might struggle with accepting. The big one, the, like the first one, is just the idea of defining the boundaries of like acceptable behavior and actually saying what Ethereum is for. So saying that Ethereum is a regenerative, sustainable project, and actually trying to actively discourage and push out degenerative behavior in a in a strong sense which really feels like something Ethereum people haven't faced up to, that they might have to do something like that. Uh, that the rules should be more um, defined in a collective participatory way. So the rules right now, they come down from the developers, let's say, uh, not really, the developers aren't like actively pushing the rules, but they're not really involving everybody in the community, allowing all the different stakeholders a voice. And I think most commons would typically have something like an assembly, maybe once every two years or something where everybody kind of says, you know, we would like to see some changes in this direction. I think there's not enough of a participatory space for people to voice what they believe Ethereum should be. And then the other one, which is really the one that they would like most freak people out, but which is very, very uh, common characteristics of well-managed commons is uh, sanctions and conflict resolution. So actually punishing people for bad behavior, which nobody in Ethereum, I think, so this would be my most controversial sort of position, but I believe, let's say if someone steals a board ape, I think there should be some mechanism by which that person can be punished. But of course, this would really be, um, like that's my most nuclear position to throw out, but it's very, every uh, well-managed commons has something like a sanction where you can then resolve the conflict yourself. So you get sanctions and then you have like six months to send the board aid back. And um, hopefully then they do. The issue is resolved internally as opposed to externally. Yeah. And um, what you've described, it sounds like what a country would do and their laws, right? And so it's very interesting you say, I mean, we recently did an episode with Kevin Awalki about, yes, regenerative finance and what that means. And I hear you on that. I think the challenge with something like Ethereum, which is permissionless because anyone could use it, how do you have these collective conversations? And now I think with Ethereum ecosystem, I do think the gatherings are, you know, around, for example, DevCon, 
and you know but the interesting thing also with ethereum is while i think the ethereum developers which are now working hard to basically work on the shanghai upgrade or, or all the kind of technical upgrades uh, for the network should it come from them or you know the interesting thing about ethereum is it has vitalik who's still you know he's he's still the lead like he's still kind of the leader but not directly like the one calling all the shots but yeah it's fascinating how a collective group of people could speak up about what ethereum should stand for who should that come from so it's interesting my final question crypto is still not widely adopted by the major world i mean the last two years has seen many entrants come in but money today i mean even i don't know about you but for me i still use the british pound to go buy my groceries you know uh, pay for bills um when or how do you see crypto cultures impacting kind of the mainstream world or does this usually happen when the bull market cycles happen and more entrants come in because of their fascination their interest in making money or getting rich quick yeah um i often think that the worst thing that ever happened to crypto was the creation of coin market cap with nothing against coin market cap itself as a website but um what it introduced into crypto. And I can remember the era before it. So I do remember a time when we didn't rank cryptocurrencies by market cap. Really? So, okay. Yeah, so it's around, I think coin market cap is around 2014 that it appears, 2013, 2014. So there was an era, you know, when, yeah, there wasn't the, this sort of market capitalization ranking. And I think once that happened, once it turned into a competition between the cryptocurrencies, we introduced the speculative angle and the, the kind of competitive type of angle. And also really the idea, of course, has always been implicit that really what the point of crypto is, is to accumulate dollars or pounds or, or euros or something uh, along those lines. So it's a, a little bit of a casino um, situation. Um, so I think that the only escape route that I can think of, which I don't see a huge amount of, I'm starting to see it in the Bitcoin world, which is why I encourage people to still pay attention to Bitcoin, even though a lot of people, when I mention Bitcoin, it does seem like I'm talking about, you know, they, they see it as a kind of like a boomer coin. Uh, but they're all interested in like uh, Ethereum and all the cool stuff on there. But there's a lot of stuff that Bitcoin kind of does, does well, even though I'm very critical of it. And what I think they're starting to do well is they are trying to really, really encourage people to use their cryptocurrency in real world context, which was something that was also attempted uh, very early on before the, the Bitcoin civil war happened. But so, for example, in the, the Bitcoin world uh, right now, they, they tend to hold events in pubs, for example, and they'll uh, encourage people to go to these pubs where uh, they accept Bitcoin and then, you know, encourage people to uh, actually go to like physical real world places where they can spend the currency. What they think they're trying to do is they're trying to break the idea that the, the currency is something you're just holding in this wallet or holding on the exchange. And they are trying to introduce that it is part of like everyday real type of money. So I think the loss of that in, say, the five or say, the, the seven or eight years between, say, 2015, when people gave up on the e-commerce, buying coffee with Bitcoin, to now basically needs to be rolled back. We need to get away from the, the pure digitization way of thinking about it. And we need to introduce a, a, the idea of like you are buying your groceries uh, with cryptocurrency. So I'm basically an advocate of trying to maybe move away from the loftier, some of the loftier proposals. I agree with Vitalik Buterin that we probably hit the primitives of DAOs, DeFi and NFTs. That's probably what Ethereum will be about and currency as well. We then need to begin turning our attention actually outwards. So we need to be we turn ourselves to uh, physical events. And I would even say that one of the main barriers here might be a little bit the conference circuit because the conference circuit encourages an insularity. So we, we attend these, and I'm guilty as anybody else, so I'm not critiquing anybody, but you, know, you go to these. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, and you're hanging out with everybody else and you kind of have this, you believe everyone is sort of in agreement with you and it, it basically makes us speak in this way that becomes impenetrable and nobody knows like if you drop someone into a e denver talk or e, like a e barcelona or something then they're just going to be like what the hell is going on here so i do think we need to get our attention back to the idea of money as something uh, mundane almost you know you say that we need to get back to applying more use cases to crypto. I actually had a conversation with a colleague the other day, and I actually think the Bitcoin community actually has more real world use cases. There are people impacting, you know, towns in like South Africa, for example, and there's actually use cases and adoption happening with Bitcoin. We've also seen Bitcoin ATMs, you know, be put in place. But I sense that Ethereum, like you said, is a bit lofty. 
how people are applying things. And even the NFT art world, it's like, okay, with art, but right now I still think NFTs are still speculative assets that people are just trading right now. So uh, yeah, we need more use cases for crypto to be widely adopted. Thank you so much for joining me on Yavcast, Paul. Thanks for having me on. We've just heard from Paul Dylan Ennis, a lecturer and assistant professor in management information systems at University College Dublin. As Paul noted, the rise of crypto may not necessarily lead to the end of traditional finance, but it can certainly shape a new chapter in the story of money. We may not know what this new paradigm will look like, but what we do know is that money is a made-up thing and it's a story constantly evolving. Similar to how we overestimate the impact of technology in the short term and underestimate its effect in the long run, we may be too early to judge the potential impact of crypto cultures. But what we can do is keep an open mind, learn from the past, and continue to explore new ideas that can shape a more equitable and sustainable culture of money. Thanks for listening to this episode of Yapcast. I'm Samantha Yap. Share this episode and subscribe to this channel to join us for another thought-provoking episode of The Story of Money by Abcast.